Welcome to another episode of Out of Spec Dave, where today I've got a very special guest. His name is Thomas. He's from upstate New York, Rochester, New York. And he reached out to me. He's got some information he'd like to share with his perspectives on something called Open Pilot, something I don't really know anything about. So let's get into it. Start this episode of Out of Spec Dave with Thomas and learn about Open Pilot. So, Thomas, welcome to uh, uh, Out of Spec, Dave, and I uh, appreciate you coming on today. You know, when you reached out to me, I was pretty intrigued with your email um, saying, yeah, you could talk to me about your EV journey. And I know you just bought a, an Ionic 5 in June, you were telling me, and I love your background there. I'm, I, I want that. I got, I got to figure <laughs> out how you did that. But, um, you know, you, you said something in your email to me, which actually got me very intrigued, which was a little bit more about open pilot. And you had mentioned that you're really a student of advanced driver assistance just from a usability standpoint and an interest standpoint. And I thought you could educate me and, and perhaps everyone else here. What is Open Pilot? How did you get involved with it? Um, what has your journey been like to be able to come on this episode today and, and hopefully educate us about what's going on? Yeah. So um, as you sort of eloquently put, Open Pilot is an advanced driver assist system, but it's something that is well beyond what you're going to get uh, sort of out of the box with any car, um, unless we're talking about maybe Tesla full self-driving. That's sort of where it's going and what it's going to become. So you just got an Ionic 5 in June, yes. correct? And so now that, and, and do you have a limited or an SEL or an SE? Which one did limited. you get? You got a, okay, so you have HDA2. Mm -hmm. Right. And which does the lane changing. It's got the scooch and some of the other features. They that claim it does. What's that? They claim, they claim it, does. it does. Has anyone experienced the scooch? Yeah, the scooch doesn't do anything. I, I mean, no my wife's GB60 has HDA1 because they ran out of chips or whatever. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I like it better than HDA2 because <laughs> I, when you when you put the turn signal on, this is getting a little off topic, but when you put the turn signal on in HDA2, it doesn't take the lane the way I want to take the lane. So with HDA1, I put the turn signal on, I take the lane, and it put and it and it picks up the lane again without having to, you know, Tesla, you got to re-engage every single time you do yeah. it. But so how have you learned about open pilot if this is your first experience with a car with ADAS? Or is it? It's not. So if we go oh, back, I, I kind like, of figured that you would say that. Yeah, if we go back to 2015, 16, um, I met my then wife and we were both really into road tripping. And I really wanted a Golf R at the time. I'd always wanted a Golf R. Right. It'd be better to have something a little bit larger. We got a Honda CRV. I wanted something I could off road just a little, like if we wanted to get up a mountain. Not, not serious, but you know, if we're going to remote locations. Yeah, overlanding. Um, yeah, and a Golf R, no, you're not doing that. <laughs> it's got a road drive, but you're not doing that. Right. Um, and that was my first experience with an ADAS system. And it had what Honda would call lane keep, which was hardly lane keep at all. I mean, it was really, it, it kind of kept you from going off the road. Um, but like I saw the promise and I thought that was really cool. And I remember I had read some article about this guy, George Hotz who had created, uh, you know, it was like a phone in a case that could drive your car. And then you could add it to it. George, is car. this the same George Hotz that when he was 17, he jailbroke the Apple iPhone, George Hotz? Yes. Yep. He was same the guy, guy who jailbroke the iPhone. Right. And then after that, he, for like probably a few weeks, I don't know, he attended the school I go to, or I went to in Rochester, RIT. Right. And so everybody kind of knew about him. He was a, you know, geek celebrity coming in. Right. And then he went and he jailbroke the PlayStation 3, had a big stat with Sony that was pretty well known in the media. Yeah. So like anytime his name kind of came up, it always sort of resonated with me. He's a hacker. Yeah. He's right. I mean, a smart hacker. Right. I mean, I, 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 I'm a little bit of a George Hotz fanboy. I think he's like the greatest hacker in the world. The guy is right. utterly brilliant. I, I loved I love when people push technology beyond its limits and find little you know, challenging opportunities to, uh, you know, to um, make things better. And, and hats off to him for what he was able to do. Absolutely. When I say hacking, I don't mean like pop culture or hacking into banks. I mean, like the process of deconstructing something, reverse engineering something, putting something back together. Um, so he, I, I went and I looked into this 
And I saw that the Honda CRV was one of the first vehicles supported by open pilot. Cool. And I'm like, well, I can't remember what it was at that time, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks. And uh, I watched the installation of it and I was like, I got an hour to install and 500 bucks or whatever. So I ordered it. I, Wait, I, is that something that Honda offered? No, no, no. This was something he created a company called comma.ai. Oh, this is what oh, so started, George Hotz created this. Yes. He oh, created, wow. right. So he created this company called comma.ai okay. and their product was open pilot. Ah, okay. I see. I'm with you. Okay. And there's actually an interesting like Tesla sidebar that we could talk about here as well, where, you know, um, back with the original autopilot, which was based on mobilized software who provides right. all the OEMs with their, you know, their, their 8S smarts and Tesla had a business falling out with them. Yeah. And it was said that George Hotz was uh, essentially hired to rewrite the mobilized stack. I remember this because I had a Model X that had AP1, which was pretty, pretty darn good. And then I remembered Tesla sort of tap dancing around. Well, and I remember the falling out with Mobileye. They're based in Israel, I think. Yeah. And then they ended up saying AP2, it's going to be better eventually than what AP1 is. So you here you are spending more money for, uh, you know, taking a step backwards, right? Which was kind of yeah. weird with AP2. Exactly. It lost a bunch of functionality because right. they had to replace what Mobileye had provided. Right. And what I had heard was that George Hotz basically rewrote the Mobileye stack in like three months. But rather than handing it over to Tesla, he uh, turned it into comma.ai. Are you saying that he went to work for Tesla? Or Yeah. And I think that there was some crazy contract at the time that was, he said like, uh, you know, that he would write it in three months or it was free. And, and, but, but how did he, how was he able to keep the IP um, if he wrote it and Tesla hired him? I don't get that. I don't know that they ever hired him. I, I think it, I know that there were conversations. I know that he went and met with Elon Musk and I know he began working on it. There may have never been a contract. I, I know see. it was orig originally was proffered three months or it's free, I um, see. but he might've just walked out of there. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the story is, but that was what got him into sort of hacking cars, ADAS systems. Oh, interesting. Okay. Got it. And so then whatever that was that he did, that's what turned into comma AI. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So they, they began by putting out a dev kit and it was, I can't remember which phone, some Chinese phone. And uh, they just, they, they took the phone, they put a case on it with a big fan and uh, it came with a little mount. You stuck it up in your windshield. You ran a cable, you ran an ethernet cable for power around your dash um, and down into the OBD2 port. And then you take off that shroud around your radar unit. And there was, back then there was a whole nother, it was a more complicated setup. There was this thing called a giraffe. There's, there's giraffes, there's pandas, all this code name for hardware. But essentially you would put a little bit of a, a, a little module that would sit in between the, um, the, the radar coming off the car and the rest of the car's communication. So, um, in a car, all the messages for steering, for throttle, and for like a million other things happen over a protocol called CAN, C-A-N. And you can tap into that CAN bus at the radar. So they had a little, like a splitter up there right. that would route that information to their device. Huh. And then they could intercept the commands and send new commands instead. So that was how it all began. And it was, it was a little bit of a rough beginning. That, that original, the Eon, man, that thing would overheat. I mean, that thing had all kinds of issues, but it was a proof of concept that worked. And this, this was in your CRV. Yeah. And, and your, your CRV, what year was your CRV? That was a 2016, I believe. Maybe it was a 2017. And what year were you doing this? I think this was 2017, the very right, beginning. So you're, you blew up your warranty, right? Your wife let you do this? Or did you, did you not, <laughs> no, so like, did you not, not with her? I, I, I don't believe this is a mess with my warranty car? at all. Like I'm not actually changing any hardware on the car. And oh, I could not. just, I, in, in, you know, one minute, two minutes, I could unplug this thing and the car is back to stock. I see. Okay. So you're driving around in a, in a, 
in a in an H on a CRV, not yeah. an HRV, in a CRV with this with this George Hotz mod for five hundred yeah. bucks, and and how did it work? Oh, it was amazing. So I literally hooked this thing up. We take it out on the road. We hit the button. Car is driving itself. No way. And you know it was driving itself kind of like like autopilot, basic autopilot today. You know it was really good lane assist. Um, and that's actually all we had was lane assist. It wasn't controlling assistive crews. We were still using the car as assistive crews, which right. is still true for a lot of vehicles that use um, open pilot today. Oh, that's changing. We can get into that. Um, but yeah, it worked. So I, I got this in there. And like one week later, we had a big cross country road trip. We were going to road trip around the country and we we're going to elope in Boulder, Colorado. And we did that. And they had a thing that would like upload the video. So it's a good dash cam too. And it would show like what portions of the driving were being done by them versus by me. And I remember looking at this thing, it didn't show a percentage, but like if the, if your drives, if the bar was green, it meant open pilot was driving. If they were gray, it meant you were driving. Right. And I looked at it. It was like 99% green. Wow. This was back. Yeah. This was 2017. And the thing just went all the way around the country. We did, I don't know how many thousands of miles. And it was like 99. Now that was all highway, mind you. Right. But still, it was 99%. Sure. Yeah. That's great. Wow. So what has, what has comma AI since then done and where, where has this evolved to with respect to open pilot? So after that, they, they put out a much better version that fixed a lot of the bugs called the comma two. Uh, we don't even need to get into that. That was like an intermediary thing. And then in about a year ago, I want to say, no, it was earlier this year, they put out advice, the comma three, and that is a beautiful piece of hardware. What like it's, SDK like uh, it is or... it is a it is the new thing that you stick in your dash. Okay, so that's and, not okay. That's not a software developer kit. That is a, a actual yes. Develop. Yeah. That's a the way that, that Comma AI makes money is selling hardware. I so see. They they want to be a consumer devices electronics company essentially. Comma and so how much did that cost you, or were you grandfathered in because you were one of the original? No, so the original device was you know hundreds of dollars. It wasn't much. There was a couple other little things you need to buy that for like mm -hmm. specific for your car. Um, comma two was a little bit more money than that. The comma three was is two thousand dollars. Okay. So the price has gone up, um, right. but so has the quality of the hardware, the experience, and the capability. Interesting. And so where, where's Comma AI located? Are they out in Cali or are they? Yeah, they are located in San Diego. In San Diego. Okay. I was just in San Diego a couple months ago. I, had I known this, um, I would have maybe asked around or what have you. Did I see last month, October, did Hotz just resign and he left the company? Are you familiar with that? You know, I saw some of the headlines. I don't really know what's going on. Um, you know, he stepped away from the company is what they said. Okay. Um, but I don't know if that's how much that's true. Now, now he's on a 12 week internship at Twitter. At Twitter. Yeah. I that's it. interesting. Elon Musk and George Hotz, maybe the two most brilliant AI minds in the world, certainly in our country. And they were both working at Twitter. Wow. That's pretty cool. I had not heard that. Maybe I just didn't know enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, it drives me nuts because I don't really think it's helping us, you know, on a global competitive, competitive race of AI, you know, that they're working on social, but I digress. Right. I, I hear you. That's a, that's a different video. We'll do that on yes, another channel. That'll video. be another out of spec channel we'll have, you know, it'll yeah. be a different topic. Um, out of spec AI. So, but, uh, so where does that leave open pilot today? And how is Open Pilot? Is Open Pilot like the, the the way it was named was like instead of autopilot, it's Open Pilot? Is that is that am I reading into it into that correctly? Yeah, I, I think that they cribbed the name a little bit just to help explain to people what it was because you know it began. I mean, it really is an autopilot competitor. It has always been an autopilot competitor, um, but it is open source. It is truly open source and. You know, I've heard them liken it to the autopilot experience and Tesla experience. It's like owning an iPhone. Everything's vertically integrated. Integrated. You get in there, it just works. Whereas this is more the Android experience, a little bit more for the tinkerer. 
you know, this is the you add it on afterward experience. I see. Now, what about the data itself that Open Pilot is generating or the car is generating? Are there third party apps that you can tap into like Teslify to be able to see where you are and the, the you know locations and GPS? How do you how do you capture all the data that's going on in this device with the Open Pilot system that you have? So you can choose to upload your data or not to them. If you upload their data, they use it for training their self-driving model. Okay. Um, they have a product called a service called Connect um, that you can go in there, view your drives that have happened, so you can use it as a dash cam. Um, if there, if it did something wrong, there's a way that you can go in there and like report to them and say, "Hey, take a look at this. You know, it, the car didn't do what I thought it was going to do." Um, they have all kinds of tooling, um, but they have a tool that they built that's been sort of critical to this build out called Cabana, which allows you to look at all the data basically flowing across your car. Um, and you can use that to suss out like, what are the codes? What If I hit brake in a Ford versus a Toyota, what is the message that's being sent? And once I know what that message is, then I can write a fork for that car that says, okay, it's this type of a Ford, this is the message for brake. So now Open Pilot understands for this car, it's this message. For that car, it's that message. And if you're really a nerd, um, you could use Cabana to, to look at really any data. It's, it's almost like uh, those OBD2 uh, readers that you get, you know, where you can check like min battery temp or whatever. Yeah, I got, I got the VPeak and I use Car Scanner. So yeah, it's yeah. like that, but taken to a whole nother level. I need that. I need that. <laughs> I love data. So it will be a learning curve. Uh, oh no! I, well, I, I now know you, so you know <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm I'm fine. I got it. You, you know I'm your student. Um, you, you know some of these systems that people rave about, maybe you know like uh, the Rivian 8S system or the Caddy 8S or GM 8S system and all that. You, you know I, I I tend to think, you know how good are they if they can only work on mapped roads? Right. To me, that seems like a severe limitation. Yeah. Um, and and I, I want to hear your thoughts about that. And and then also I'd like to hear your thoughts about a open pilot as as a solution in concept. And then I want to understand where how does this become open pilot a reality, even in cars that are offering ADAS today? Um, so I didn't mean to throw three questions at you in one shot, but I have so many in my brain. I figure I'd only let three out at one time. <laughs> Wait, let's start here. Um, one thing that differentiated open pilot to me from other things is like, it is not vaporware. There's all these self-driving companies and they are largely scams. They're, they're, they're raising VC money and they're not putting anything out and they don't really have anything that's legitimate. They got some guy in the backseat driving with an Xbox controller. Um, not to name any names, um, but you know, it's a little bit of a joke. And then if you go on YouTube, you can and you're, find- you're, regular... you're, You know, I, I'm, I'm not gonna, you're not gonna name them, but is that truly happening today? <laughs> oh yeah, well, well I, how many of them are left? I mean, there's been a lot of self-driving car startups that have gone under. Right. But, but I mean, you think about like, um, wh who's the, the company out of San Fran today that's offering ride share programming with self car. There are some that are out there that are, sure. that are working, right? Sure. Um, you know, Chevy has, uh, their, their, uh, oh, what is it called? Is it cruise or whatever? Super cruise. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a self-driving. Oh, uh, there's a self. -dri okay. I ranch don't know. And, um, obviously there's Tesla, um, there's Google with Waymo. Waymo um, right. There's a lot of people with a lot of different approaches. Mm -hmm. But what's really cool about this is you can go on YouTube, find regular people like me who have put up videos, you know, usually time-lapse videos of their car driving hundreds or thousands of miles without them intervening. Mm -hmm. um, thousands of people, I don't know how many right now, but there are many thousands of people who use Open Pilot every single day. So, and you can buy it. It's a real product, you can buy it. You know that it works because thousands of people have used it before you and you can watch videos of it working. Um, you know, it's not vaporware. It's not some product that some big company is talking about to juice their stock that's never gonna come. Like you can put it in your car today. And can you put it on, can you run it on your, um, your Ionic 5? 
Yes. And that was a huge reason that I purchased it. Wow. Okay. That I did not know. You got to talk to me about that. How, like, how does that work compared to HDA2? So much better. Really? So much better. Oh my God. Wow. But uh, yeah, so they put out the Comma 3 device earlier this year. Okay. And it has a lot more power. It has more cameras. It has true 360 vision. And they said that by the end of this year, they were going to do a Taco Bell run. They were going to go into their car, input the destination. The car would take them to Taco Bell with no, no, no intervention from them. And that drive is important because that drive would have sort of everything that you need to do to prove it out. There would be highway, there'd be city, there'd be a left turn, a right turn, a stoplight, a stop sign, whatever, right? Like it was a basic proof of concept of like full self-driving, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was a key at EV6, which had uh, HDA2. That was the, and they bought an EV6 with that to do this. And I thought, okay, so I know the EV6 with HDA2 is going to be the first vehicle to be able to, you know, give the full experience, so to speak. And I wow. knew that, and then I saw the Ionic 5, which is a whole story of how I got into that. But I was like, hey, that's the same car. You know, that's the sister car. Yeah. No, I, I knew that that and the GV60, well, it's the GV60 is HDA1. I really wanted HDA2. I wanted the exact whatever yeah. they had. Yeah, you got to get an EV6 or an, or an Ionic 5 if you want HDA2. But you yeah. know what? I'm like listening. I'm really listening here because I only have HDA1 down in the garage. And if I can get Open Pilot working on this thing, you know what Kathy's commute's going to be like from going forward? We, we got to fire this puppy up. <laughs> you got to come down here next weekend. We got to get H, We got to get Open Pilot running on Kathy's GV60. Yeah, that would be awesome. I I don't know if there's any if I, there's somebody at least one person if not more with a GV60 right now working on getting support for it. Okay. So every time there's a new car, most cars it's very easy to add support. The support is very capable, but there's like a little bit of a technical process that has to happen to support that car. And right. usually all that it takes is one person owning one and being like and just like raising their hand and saying, "Hey, can we get support for my car?" And then the uh, the Uber geeks will step in and, and help them port their car. Right. So what cars are you familiar with that Open Pilot works on today? So the Ionic 5 support for that officially landed in like August, I think. Um, and that was the 200th supported car. There are 200 different models yes. of cars that forget about EV. This is really in, 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 a, in a lot of respects, this is just... This is auto steering and dynamic mm -hmm. cruise. It, it, propulsion is is a separate issue, correct? It's, it doesn't matter if it's ICE or EV. No, it really doesn't matter. Okay, got it. Okay, that makes sense. That yeah, makes so basically sense. any car, if your car has assistive cruise control and some sort of lane keep, in theory, Open Pilot could support it. There may be like a couple, uh, there might be a little bit of like fine print on that and that fine print is dissipating. Like part of that fine print is um, up until now, they've used the car's um, radar for, you know, for keeping the proper distance. Um, and like, for instance, a lot of German cars use a different form of radar. Um, I'm blanking on what it's called. Um, Flexray. They use Flexray. Um, Open Pilot does not support Flexray. That is a small minority of certain luxury cars. But generally speaking, if you have lane keep, assistive cruise, you know, if it's a car built in the last five years, it's probably going to be possible. Wow. That's amazing. So so now, is Kama AI trying to license this? I mean, it seems it would be counterintuitive for them to license this to the manufacturers because they've got their own systems. Or is that, are you aware that they're trying to build this technology into the actual, you know, a consumer delivered products? Or is this always going to be a third party add on? I think they always want it. They want to be, I believe, like a consumer electronics company. I think they look at Apple and they say, hey, if we can sell hardware directly, there's a lot more money to be made in that. If I can sell, you know, what's the addressable market? How many cars are there that this supports? It's almost every car that's ever built going forward. Right. And if we can put out a something that's $2,000, I mean, what's the, if you want to go from HDA1 to HDA2, in an Ionic, how many thousands of dollars is that trim level difference between the SE and the SEL, yeah. right? 
Yeah, it's and probably it, less it, than the cost of of a comma device, right? So where where do you see all of this going, Thomas? Well, I'm hoping to Taco Bell by the end of this year. You know, in your I, mean, I want drive. I want full self driving. You're right? going for the Chalupa with the Diet Coke. Yeah, is I, I want doing. full self driving. You want um, so, you're going you know, full self driving. I got this because you get on the highway. If you're say doing a thousand miles, you press the button, and the car drives. It takes away so much stress, and even though you do need to pay attention now, I cannot stress that enough. You are the responsible entity in the car. Uh, don't expect it to react right if a deer runs out in front of you or anything like that. Right. But when I have this engaged, all of my focus and attention goes towards other cars. Like you don't realize how much stress it puts on you to just do the basic task of lane centering. I agree with you. I agree and with when you. you don't have to do that, you have attention and focus that you can pay to other cars because those are the ones that that's the real danger. That's you know what? There, there's there's two different mentalities of people. I have a good friend. I'm not going to name who he is. I will say that it is a he, um, and he thinks autopilot is just going to drive the car for him, and, yeah. and he doesn't have FSD or even enhanced. He's just got you know he's just doing lane cruising. Yeah, I might know that guy. He relies on it, right? Everyone knows that guy. Everyone has a buddy who has who knows yeah. that guy. To me, I have a heightened awareness whenever I am using the basic autopilot in my car or in Kathy's car, HDA1. Why? Because I'm super curious as to what the car is going to do. So I am mm -hmm. fascinated with the technology. And someone made a decision three years ago in a computer lab somewhere and programmed the system or if it's you know, artificially learning itself. I'm curious about what the car is doing. So I become hyper, hyper aware and, and it keeps me more engaged, but I'm not sitting there fine tuning, you know, the, the going back and forth. I find it to be way less stressful for, for, uh, you know, road tripping, but I'm more engaged as a driver, not less engaged. Mm -hmm. Everyone has that sort of DNA switch. Some people have the opposite. They become less engaged those people scare me because these systems are still not ready. Um, I don't care what anybody says. They're not ready yet. Well, that's you a great segue. You have to watch it. What if a, a woman with a baby carriage or a man with a baby carriage is walking across the street? You damn well better be ready to hit the brake just yeah. in case something doesn't, you know, doesn't go right. Has, has, has anyone used open pilot on a Tesla? Yes, there's actually a Tesla group of hackers who have gotten in. And I don't, I'm not sure. I, I do know that it was older Teslas, um, 2012, 13, you know, Model S's I saw that were rigged up with it. I don't okay, know. Okay, so not even AP1 cars. These, these were just, I mean, prior yeah, to, let's say. I, I believe I saw something a few months ago that there is actually a process to get it into modern Teslas. Um, a lot of people prefer open pilot to autopilot. You know, if you've used both, you I think you're probably going to prefer open pilot personally. Um, so there's definitely been a push to get it. I don't know where that exactly stands. Right. So when but, you think about it, it, it with 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 uh, Tesla selling, you know, on a SaaS basis, one ninety nine a month uh, FSD, which I think is kind of a you know, that's something I'll probably play around with. I think Kyle just activated in his plaid the other day to have have some experience with it and he has experience with it in the past and and look kyle is um he's a pretty brave guy nothing really scares him fsd when he did it he's like yeah. dad this thing is is just not ready for prime time and i mean they they made a goofy video but it was doing some stupid things i've heard it's gotten a lot better which is great has do you know if anyone's been able to work with a, a rivian or one of these cars that does pre-mapped roads have they have they rigged I have it not up on heard roads? you know and a lot of times again it's just a matter of somebody who needs to who owns that car right needs to come into the community and say hey i'd like to support it is all what does it mean not Tell me what it means to come into the community. Help me understand that. Yeah, so they have a Discord channel, um, which is where most support is handled. Um, it's where new users come, they learn, they ask questions. And very often somebody will be like, hey, you know, I just got a GV60. You know, I'd like to add support. Can someone help me do it? Right. And is there a leader of this Discord or is it just pretty much the group, the, the, the overall community? The, that's the common employees are there and they moderate. 
Um, but if I can go backwards a little bit, there was sure, a really yeah. nice segue in there about um, about safety, about paying attention. Um, and it really gets into what makes open pilot so profoundly different from pretty much everything else on the road. To start, open pilot is what they call a true end-to-end -end system. And the way that it works, the way that it learns is they collect driving data from humans, videos of them driving, and they look at what do humans do. And the reality is that good drivers all pretty much do the same thing. Good drivers stay between the mustard and the mayo. Um, bad drivers deviate, right? So if you were to look at a distribution of drivers handling different situations, the ones that are all clustered together, that's good driving, right? Mm -hmm. So that is, um, that is fundamentally how their process learns. It looks at what humans do. And from there, it discerns what the, how to chart a path forward. So uh, in other systems, they would say, uh, uh, some engineers would sit down and they would say, these are what lane lines are. Stay between the lane lines. The critical thing is open pilot has no knowledge of lane lines. It has no knowledge. Nobody taught it what a stoplight is. Nobody taught it what a stop sign is. Um, it has no clue. Uh, if you're familiar with Google's um, AI project where they created that superhuman uh, Go playing uh, AI and it beat the world champion at Go, um, that system had never been taught what Go is. What it did is it watched thousands, if not millions or billions of matches of Go, and it discerned what the game was and how to win. And that is my understanding of how open pilot is working. It is looking at what humans do. And from there, it is holistically determining what should be done. And their, their so, strategy is it should drive like a human, not how does it How does it programmed. see what humans are doing? Is there a camera that sees you? Yeah. So it, and that's where I was going to segue to. So when you drive a vehicle with open pilot, yeah. um, it is incredibly natural how it centers in the lane, um, how it understands not to take exits instead of staying in the lane. A lot of, there's so many little subtleties and um, you don't get that when you use something like HDA one or two um, or even super cruise because all of these systems are heavily programmed. And I think autopilot gets itself into trouble a little bit because they're, they are also trying to do the same thing. They are at the base level trying to work the way that open pilot is, but they are, my understanding thing is impatient. I've heard allegations that, you know, Elon Musk just wanted it to drive to his house. Mm. And so, so he had, so the programmers write an abstraction layer on top of that sort of actual learned behavior to say, hey, if you're in this sort of a situation, just take a right, right? And so then you see autopilot doing things that are a little bit unnatural or even with full self-driving, they have an issue with a stop sign and they push an update to make that better, but something else gets worse. Now all of a sudden yeah. there's a regression. And with open pilot, I've been using like six years, seven years, and it's like, there aren't regressions. It's hmm. amazingly predictable. It only gets better. Hmm. Wow. Now, driver monitoring is really interesting because their latest version, they had, so I should have mentioned that it is a hands-free system. There is a camera that is watching you and making sure that you're paying attention. And um, it works spectacularly well. Like I, I cannot fool it. It is never wrong. So if you it look will... away, it's going to turn off. What's that? If yeah, you look absolutely. away, it'll turn off. If you look away, first off, it's scene aware. So if it looks at the scene, it goes, you know what? You are on a perfectly straight road out west. There's no traffic around you. Beautiful lines. This is the simplest situation. And you look away it's gonna give you more leeway to not pay attention. I see. If you're in traffic, if it's curvy, if it's night, if it's wet, then it's gonna go, you know what? This is a little bit more of a sketchy situation and it's not gonna give you that leash. Right. So if you look away, it's gonna first flash on the screen and then it's going to give escalating prompts. And if you really don't pay attention, it's gonna go off like a siren. Okay. And then when you say it's gonna display on the screen, does it display on your Ionic 5? on the actual Ionic 5 screen, or is there a separate screen module? I believe it doesn't, but it, that can be added. I think maybe in my Pacifica or my CRV it did. Um, so like that just gets into like the nuances of 
support levels for one car versus the next. And, and if you get in the weeds on this, there is a big difference. One car with open pilot can be a very different experience than another car with open pilot. I depending see. on what that car, open pilot tries to maximize the capabilities of a given car. But if like a car manufacturer says, hey, we can only put this small amount of torque on the wheel before it gives up, well, then you're not going to make a tight turn in that car. Right. I'm curious, does the Discord have any kind of rating system as to which car it translates to the best and rank it by scoring system? So I believe now on there, they have a compatibility page on comma.ai. Um, and it, it gives you like a sense of how good they are and what kind of an experience you're going to get. I see. Um, like how, how much of the, the full-fledged comma experience you're going to get or if it's going to be a little bit watered down. Right. Interesting. It will so, always be an upgrade for your car, though. You know, with open pilot, it seems that it's it's actually learning from the data, which is something I always thought Tesla was capturing data so they can make their system better. But I still I don't see it like certain bridge that you come to and you get that phantom braking for years. Right. I'm yeah. starting to see less of it in the new Model S that I have, which is vision based, which is confusing to me because I would think more inputs are better, whether it's LIDAR, radar, sonar and vision. But um, there's a lot going on in this space. This is not a career for you. This is a hobby for you, just a passion of yours. Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. Just a hobby. I just wanted to make my road trips better. Right. That's great. All right. You got the mic. You take us home. What are your last thoughts on this conversation today? You know, I would like I would like to really underscore like the safety importance because that just kind of always gets missed on these systems, um, these kinds of talks. The coolest thing to me now that just got shipped is when they do driver monitoring, that is now end to end too. So what that means is like they they know like if you made an input, if you changed an input, what did you you st you steered because you saw something? What were you doing right before that? Whatever that is, that is. That if I looked at enough instances of that, that is driver attentiveness. We can now predict what an attentive driver looks like. Similarly, if you're parked, or you're set up at a light and you're messing around on your phone, we know what inattentiveness looks like. So they just ship this. So like the driver monitoring now is like insanely good. You mm -hmm. like can't beat it pretty much right. good. Um, so they're using like legitimate AI machine learning to understand what is an attentive driver look like? What is an inattentive driver look like? And how can we do that to improve the overall safety of the system? And I don't know of anything else out there that is even remotely close. And, and based on that data capturing in real time, whether or not the driver at that particular, in that not just in that vehicle, but a driver of that vehicle, are they able to adjust dynamically the capabilities of what open pilot is going to allow a person to do? For example, how much leeway, you know, within the bowling lanes, is it going to give someone or, or is it, or is it based on just the car itself rather than the driver? You know, again, it is seen aware. Their whole thing is just pay attention. If you don't pay attention, we're going to beep at you and we're going to shut the system off. I see. So it's more of a timely thing than it is gathering the data about a particular user of that car uh, at any point in time. Yeah, absolutely. I got you. Um, they okay. do gather an inordinate amount of data if you choose to upload it. You know, I always kind of laugh a little bit the whole like Tesla's uploading all this data. And I'm kind of like, you know, like they have all these high resolution cameras, you know, like high resolution cameras, like the size of the video, you would be uploading you yeah. know, 100 gigabytes every time you go out. Like, Trust me, I know. With uploading, what I'm going to upload this video tonight, it's going to take a long time. Just yeah, and so simple. They, they, weren't, they were never uploading all of that data. Right. With OpenPilot, actually, you're uploading the high-res data, everything, all the videos. Um, so that, that always kind of fascinated me, although they actually honestly have more data than they need. They How do they get the data? Is that a subscription? Data. Is that something you have to pay a monthly subscription to in order to get the cell, about the, the, the data up to them? Uh, no. So you, you don't have to pay any subscription and you can view the last three days worth of drives that you've essentially done. You can download them off if you needed to, like if there was an incident. They do have a subscription and then you get um, access to the last year's worth of videos. Um, and the subscription also has some other niceties, which really gets into where open pilot is going. The right. big, the big thing with open pilot this year is by the end of this year, they want 
you to be able to route to Taco Bell. And what that means is it has to understand navigation, right? And so that subscription is also going to be necessary to have like a cloud connection to, you know, um, you know, mapping software. Right. So you're going to need that if you want to, you know, type in an address and, and, and get your Chalupa. Right. No, that's, that's great. Well, listen, what I'd like everyone to do, if you're, if you've stuck with this this long, first of all, thank you very much. I, for one, am, am just blown away, fascinated with what I've learned tonight. But what I'd like to do is comment below um, what you would like to perhaps hear more about or, or maybe see in, in demonstrations on, on uh, the open uh, pilot system. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions that, that uh, people have. But Thomas, thank you so much for taking time out of your, your day here to educate me and everyone else about what this is all about. Fascinating discussion. And I, I think this is like, you know, one of those things when you see the tip of the iceberg, right? But you know, there's an iceberg under there. I got so much to learn. This is just fascinating to me. So thank you so much, Thomas, for this, uh, for your time. And, uh, you know, really appreciate you joining and, and we'll definitely uh, stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching another episode of Out of Spec Dave, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care now. Bye-bye.